بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلله فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا فعلمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا كريم My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh So we left off last week where there were signs leading to the fact that revelation was going to come to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has started performing tahannuth, isolating himself in the cave, reflecting, distancing himself from the uh, vices of Mecca at that time. And we had seen that from time to time, Jibreel used to give salam to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but would not make himself apparent until finally the day of revelation came in the month of Ramadan and in the uh, Gregorian calendar in the year 610. In the year 610. And Jibreel makes himself apparent to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And you can imagine what a frightening experience it is That you've been going back and forth this whole entire time and no one's ever been in sight But then all of a sudden, with no footprints, with no sounds, with no trail All of a sudden a voice shouts and commands you, read, Ikra! And you can imagine how scared and petrified the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets And this was the beginning of the first revelation which was Surah Al-Alaq now, I want to, to comment over here briefly. To us, understanding that Surah Al-Alaq being the first revelation is almost consensus. Like no one's going to have a difference of opinion amongst us. And this is going to be pretty much unanimous. Whereas if you look at the early collections of Hadith and the early collections of Sirah, that unanimous consensus did not exist. And what's very fascinating is that the unanimous consensus starts to develop after the compilation of Sahih al-Bukhari. And this goes back to you know, the, the effort that Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah put together in compiling Sahih al-Bukhari to facilitate knowledge. Because prior to that, there were opinions that Surah al-Mudathir was the first uh, surah revealed. There was uh, opinions that Surah Fatiha was the first surah revealed among some other verses as well. And then after Sahih al-Bukhari, all of a sudden there's unanimous consensus. So now, these first six verses of Surah Al-Alaq uh, come down to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in these verses, there's this command to read and to recite. And oftentimes we focus on the literacy component, which is in contrast to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being unlettered. And I think that's a, a very important component to, to highlight. Whereas the vast majority of people at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam were unlettered. And here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is commanded with read and recite, which is physically impossible for him. But this was an indication that that which seems impossible to you right now will become possible with the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Iqra bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. Read and recite in the name of your Lord, the one that created you. And this is going to be a, a very powerful reminder throughout his whole life that you will be afraid, it will be a very daunting task, but as long as you remember the one that created you, you will be able to achieve all of those things. Like asking the one that is unable to read and recite, to read and recite. So now when you focus on that component of it, we focus to uh, a, a second component, which is an ummah of knowledge. An ummah of knowledge. So if you remember back that it was the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that is now documenting things. That is now documenting things, right? That was the miracle that Ibn Hazm rahimahullah spoke about. And it is taking this very miracle that we're going to expand upon even further. It is the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is commanded to recite وَقُرْ رَبِّ زِدْنِ ilma That say, O oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. It is the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa that is commanded طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٍ وَمُسْلِمَةٌ That the seeking of knowledge is mandatory and compulsory upon every male and female Muslim. Um, Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah, if you study his biography, you'll notice that he balanced his life between two things. Being a scholar of Islam at its highest level, where he was called Amir al-Mu'mineen fil-Hadith, 
and he was also a mujahid in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he fought in many many wars and expeditions so when Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah he's asked if you could be recreated and just dedicate your life to one of these things what would you choose and we all know of the many virtues that come behind you know sacrificing your life for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he says without a shadow of a doubt I would sacrifice my life in seeking knowledge in seeking knowledge there's nothing more virtuous than it and I want to, to highlight this point for a variety of reasons you know we see uh, a growing ignorance in the ummah unfortunately on a daily basis and a lot of that could stem from a disconnect that people have with their scholars with their masajid with the language of the Quran but it's not about access though right everyone has access to the internet everyone has access to translations everyone has access to books everyone has access to lectures it's the desire to learn it's the desire to grow it's the desire of understanding that as you increase yourself in knowledge you distance yourself from the hellfire bi'ithnillahi ta'ala right so it is that with that motivation that we need to continue this desire to learn and grow based upon this very first revelation so now this incident happens in the cave and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam comes running down to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha saying cover me cover me and you can imagine again the frantic and the panic but what's really fascinating over here is the natural response that Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha had right she didn't dwell into the details describe for me exactly what happened she didn't tell me you know what did he look like how tall was he how short was he how big was he how small was he you know what was the fragrance none of that her main concern was that she wanted to console her husband and this goes back we didn't discuss this in the class but one of the things that the book mentions but she actually had a foretelling that the Prophet ﷺ was going to become a prophet and that is why she was prepared for it so you can imagine her relationship with Waraka ibn Nawfal that preceded her knowledge that her, the, the knowledge of Waraka ibn Nawfal preceded it and thus she was informed that the Prophet ﷺ was going to become a prophet and thus she had that natural response number two it's such a beautiful reaction that when someone is anxious and almost having a panic attack how you comfort them and you console them right reminding them of their good deeds reminding them of the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminding them how they've lived a good life assalamu alaikum my friend how do you do would you like to take this I will give this to you on one condition one condition I give it to you but then you sit down do we have a deal bismillah you're gonna go sit down now inshallah khair you can't win all of them right you can't win all of them so now uh, the, her, her, how to console someone that's having a, a panic attack so if you look at the words of Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha she's telling the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that your Lord would never forsake you you've always been kind to the orphans you've always been kind to your family and relatives you spend on the poor and the destitute all of those things Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha is consoling him with which brings us to point number three and this is a you know, continuation from yesterday's session on what do men really want from marriage. Men want someone to support them, right? Men want someone to be there by their side. Men want someone that's unconditionally going to love them in their most desperate of situations. And for the Prophet wasallam, this was his first major challenge. And the fact that Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha stood by his side meant a lot. Because you know that comfort is going to be there, insha'Allah, as more uh, troubling and difficult situations arise. As more troubling and difficult situations arise. So eventually, um, and actually I'll, I'll read the quote from here. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, quoted in the book. Uh, the question is, was Khadija radiallahu anha surprised by the Prophet's revelation? He says, she was aware that at some point this was going to happen. This is what she has been waiting for. When he has doubts about the authenticity of his experience, she reminds him, you take care of the orphan, you look after the widow, you give charity to people in need, and you help the oppressed. How could your Lord abandon you? How could your Lord abandon you? She eventually takes him to Waraka ibn Nawfal. She eventually takes him to Waraka ibn Nawfal. And look at Waraka ibn Nawfal, what he says. I wish I were younger. I wish I could live up to the time when your people would turn you out. 
Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. I'm going to take this away now, okay? And I'm going to ask you to sit down, inshallah. Can you go sit with mommy? Where's mommy? Mommy's right over here. Look at mommy. Look at mama. Look at mama. Yeah, look at mama. Right over there. Jazakallah khair. Thank you so much. Um, he says, anyone who came with something similar to what you have brought was treated with hostility. And if I should be alive till that day, then I would support you strongly. I would support you strongly. So this happens after revelation, right? Now, what is the uh, insinuation over here? Like he says, if I live to the day that people would outcast you, I would support you on that day. What is the insinuation? Say it. He would become Muslim or he's already Muslim? Or he's already Muslim, right? So would this make him the first man that accepted Islam, right? And we're going to get into all these discussions as to who the first man was. And this leads into like, you know, those, those, those very interesting discussions but have very little fruit to them, right? That doesn't make a difference who the first person that accepted Islam was. Not really. It's an interesting fact to know as to how scholars discuss this issue. 100% without a shadow of a doubt. So some of the people did conclude, and oh, it's, a, it's more of a modern day opinion, that Waraq ibn Nufal was actually the first man to accept Islam, was actually the first man to accept Islam. So now, two things happen after this trip to Waraq ibn Nufal. Number one, there's a silence in Revelation. There's a silence in Revelation. And number two, even though the Prophet wasallam is being consoled by Khadija radiallahu anha, and the experience was very real, and this is like another benefit. Why was there a need for Jibreel to squeeze the Prophet ﷺ? Like why did that incident actually happen? And one of the wisdoms that scholars derive from it is that if something is just in your mind, it'll come and go in your mind. But as soon as physical touch is there, all of a sudden it becomes real. Right? So when someone thinks they're hallucinating, what do you do? You pinch them to make them understand that, look, this isn't a hallucination, this is happening in real life. So the fact that the Prophet ﷺ remembers the physical squeeze of Jibreel, this is to remind him that this was not a hallucination of his imagination, but this was something that physically happened. Yet even with that happening, the Prophet ﷺ still doubted, you know, what was it that actually happened? Could this have been real? Could this have been real? Right? It's a, it's a very surreal experience that of all of humanity, you have been chosen to be a prophet of God. Out of all of the people of Mecca, you have been chosen to be that prophet and messenger. So there's silence in terms of revelation. There's doubt from the Prophet ﷺ. Now, there's some commentary, and I'll actually quote this from the book, and I'll speak about where it comes from. It says, The first revelation is followed by a brief period of silence, which leads the prophet to doubt in his own sanity. On several occasions, he nearly throws himself off mountain cliffs. But each time he is greeted by Jibreel, who reminds him that he is indeed God's messenger. So this issue of the Prophet ﷺ attempting to throw himself off of cliffs. This is reported in Sahih al-Bukhari as a mu'allak form. In the sense that it is not a complete narration, but it is a cut-off narration. And the cut-off narrations inside Sahih al-Bukhari do not actually have the same rulings as those that have connected chains. So oftentimes when you find scholars quote this, and they say it's in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's disingenuous. Because when we say that something is quoted in Sahih al-Bukhari, it's a complete chain of narration that is guaranteed to be authentic. Not the mu'allaqat, not the ones that are cut off. So that's something that's very important to keep in mind. Number two, did the Prophet ﷺ actually attempt to kill himself? And the answer to that is, from the vast majority of scholars, the answer is no. And in fact, the only people that have said that he did attempt to throw himself off were not actually scholars of Islam. They were scholars in you know, various other fields. Because you can imagine that why would the Prophet ﷺ attempt to do that? Right? This was not befitting of the character of the Prophet ﷺ. And there's a more detailed discussion if you go to uh, islamqna.com, uh, Shaykh Saleh al munajjids website. In Arabic and in English, you can find an article that in detail discusses the narrations that talk about uh, the Prophet ﷺ allegedly trying to throw himself off the cliff. So in reality, this is not a true claim and should not be mentioned about the Prophet ﷺ. Then he goes on to say that the second revelation that came to the Prophet ﷺ 
was Surat Al-Qalam. And unlike Surat Al-Alaq, there is no unanimous consensus at this point. And I believe there is room for speculation whether it was Surat Al-Muddathir, whether it was Surat Al-Muzammil, whether it was uh, Surat Al-Qalam. And in fact, the way the author, Mi'raj Muhyiddin, frames it, it actually makes sense as to why it would be Surat Al-Qalam. Because Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala begins with Noon wal qalami wa ma yasturun that taking an oath by the letter Noon and then saying that by the pen and the, the, the writing that it does on the lines, right? So Surat Al-Alaq refers to the pen and here's the continuation of the pen. Then the third verse, وَمَا أَنْتَ بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ بِمَجْنُونَ And it is not by the mercy of you, and it is by the mercy of your Lord that you, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, have not lost your sanity, right? So it ties into the fact that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam felt as if he was going insane and was doubting himself. So it fits in perfectly as to why Surah Al-Qalam might be the second revelation. Then we also have Surah Al-Muzammil and Surah Al-Muddathir. يَا أَيُّهَا الْمُزَمِّلْ O one who is covered up. قُمِ اللَّيْلَ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا Stand up and pray except for a portion of the night. And this was where the Prophet wasallam was meant to get his source of strength, right? His source of strength was in his connection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by praying at night, by praying at night. And then you have Surat Al-Muddathir. Ya أَيُّهَا الْمُدَّثِرْ قُمْ فَأَنذِرْ That, O oh, one who is covered up, stand up and preach. So now he's been given the command to preach. So it's very possible that any of these three surahs could have been the second revelation. And in terms of a majority opinion, Allah knows best, but it seems that the majority were of the opinion that Surah Al-Muddathir was the second revelation, was the second revelation. Now, one of the accusations against the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi Wasallam by Orientalists, by non-Muslims, is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in fact did not receive revelation, but he was having epileptic seizures. And they said that this was due to the fact that he would hear a ringing in his ear, he would be sweating, uh, bullets of sweat, even though it is very cold outside. We have a Muslim convert, William Montgomery Watt. He's one of the sources of, of the book. He wrote uh, Sira books in 1953 and 1954. SubhanAllah, right? Like 70 years ago. It's, it's wild to think about non-Muslim converts writing about, um, you know, the Sira of the Prophet ﷺ at that time. He says, he would be gripped by a feeling of pain and in his ears there would be a noise-like reverberation of a bell. Even on a cold day, the bystanders would see great pearls of sweat on his forehead as the revelation descended upon him. Such accounts led some Western critics to suggest that he had epilepsy, but there are no real grounds for such a view. Epilepsy leads to physical and mental degeneration and there are no signs of that in Muhammad wasallam. On the contrary, he was clearly in full possession of his faculties to the very end of his life. To the very end of his life. So now, these, the second revelation comes down. And then again, you're going to have a period of a dry spell where no revelation is coming down. And then the Quraysh, they start seeing this. Because anytime revelation will come down, you would see something happening in Quraysh society. That was being given, people start praying, you know, the, 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 the call uh, to other Muslims is being given. And then when a dry spell happens, none of that is happening during that time. So Um Jamil, she comes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, she's the wife of Abu Lahab, and she says, even your Lord has forsaken you. Even your Lord has forsaken you. And that is when Surah Al-Duha was revealed. That is when Surah Al-Duha was revealed. And Surah Al-Duha in its essence is a very, very important surah. It's a very, very important surah because this was the consoling of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that he would need till the end of his mission. To hear the words, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى That your Lord has not abandoned you, nor does He detest you. Your Lord has not abandoned you, nor does He detest you. And this would stay with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all the way till the end. And you can imagine that this was perhaps the moment that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stops having that doubt and gets that reaffirmation that he needs from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Which shows us the fragility of human condition on how we always need a boost to our self-confidence, to our self-esteem, need that positive affirmation in our lives that yes, I am capable and yes, I will be able to do it. 
those that were fortunate like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received it from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala but that leaves a great burden on our shoulders that when we don't feel it we need to surround ourselves with people that do believe in us we need to surround ourselves with people that do believe in us and then those that are surrounding people need to do a better job of encouraging and motivating and believing and so on and so forth and I believe that's very very important subhanAllah so Surah Al-Duha comes down and then revelation becomes more consistent so now during this time let's speak about the first companions so we have Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha she is the first woman that accepts Islam but then from amongst the men you have three main men that are in contention who was the first to accept Islam? Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zayd ibn Haritha, and uh, Abu Bakr uh, ibn Abi Qahafa uh, radiallahu anhu, radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Um, who was the first of them to accept Islam? So as I mentioned, the story of Warak ibn Nawfal, it puts him in contention as well, even though he's not often considered. And then they break it down that Ali ibn Abi Talib was the first young man, prepubescent, to accept Islam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, was the first man to accept Islam and Zayd ibn Haritha was the first freed slave to accept Islam was the first freed slave to accept Islam and that's how they broke down the categories amongst the men other men that accepted Islam very early on was Abdurrahman ibn Auf whose name was uh, Abdu Amr ibn Auf at that time and Abu, Ub uh, Abu Ubaid al-Amr ibn Jarrah so these are the uh, first men there's a very fascinating story as to how Uthman and Talha end up accepting Islam all from uh, the Meccan era. So during the first days of revelation, a successful young merchant by the name of Uthman ibn Uffan was on his way home from trading in Syria when he is awoken in the desert by the words, sleepers awake for verily Ahmad has come forth in Mecca. And then Ahmad being uh, referred to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Before reaching Mecca, Uthman runs to, uh, into Abu Bakr's cousin, Talha bin Ubaidillah, who tells Uthman that he recently asked about the very same Ahmad by a, monk, by a monk in Syria. So he was asked by a monk in Syria about this Ahmad. The two returned to Mecca and approached their friend Abu Bakr with the news. Abu Bakr explains what has transpired during their absence and that he has embraced Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam as one of God's chosen prophets. Uthman and Talha visiting the, visit the prophet and join his cause. So now the group of men that you have around the Prophet sallam, you have Ali radiallahu anhu, Zayd ibn Haritha, you have Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, you have Uthman ibn Affan, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Abu Ubaidah al-Amr ibn Jarrah, and Talha bin Ubaidillah. There is this often uh, statement, and you know this comes later on when the Najashi um, is questioning Abu Sufyan, you know, who follows him, the rich or the poor? Yes, without a shadow of a doubt, the vast majority of followers of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam were the poor but the very first few people first few men that followed the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam were the rich and the affluent were the rich and the affluent and they are the ones that remained loyal and dedicated to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam till his very final days so this is a very important point in terms of when you're giving dawah do you focus on the elite the aristocrats you know the social influencers or do you focus on the majority who are not from the elite, not from the aristocrats, not from the influencers? Where should the focus on da'wah be? And when you look at the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, clearly without a shadow of a doubt, there's things that naturally happen by the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because some of these people were naturally in close relationship to the Prophet ﷺ, Zayd ibn Haritha, Ali ibn Abi Talib, and Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. But then everyone else is accepting Islam or being guided indirectly through Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. So the lesson over here is not really about who you're giving da'wah to, it's about who are you choosing as your close friends? Who are you choosing as your close friends? And if you can find someone that is pious and righteous and of good character and has influence, Allahu Akbar. There are not very many more things that you could hope for. And Abu Bakr radiallahu ta'ala anhu indirectly guided so many people to Islam that were from the affluent and the rich that were supporting the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam till the very last days. And this is a summary of year number one. Year number two, year number two of uh, Revelation. And this is how the book actually gets divided thereon in, where it goes Quranic year one, Quranic year two. And Quranic year two, 
uh, he argues that this is when Surat al-Muzammil and Surat al-Mudathir were revealed, as opposed to being earlier revelations. But he says this is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala started introducing uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim at the beginning of the revelations. So when you study Ulum al-Qur'an, one of the questions that arises is Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim actually a verse in the Qur'an or not? And if we go back and, and, and summarize the opinions, there's consensus that in Surah An-Naml, in the letter that Sulaiman writes, وَإِنَّهُ مِن سُلَيْمَانِ وَإِنَّهُ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ By consensus, that is a verse of the Qur'an. But then at the beginning of every surah, they say that بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ is a part of the Qur'an, but is not a part of the surah. But is not a part of the surah. So 113 times in the Qur'an, except for Surah At-Tawbah, you have بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ It's not a verse in the surah itself, but it is still a part of the Qur'an. It is still a part of the Qur'an. Surah At-Tawbah doesn't have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim at the beginning of it. And there's a discussion as to, is it a, condi- is it a continuation from Surah Al-Anfal? Or is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about the mushrikun and he doesn't want to affiliate mercy with the way that he will deal with them, with the way that he will deal with them. And then last but not least, is Surah Al-Fatiha an exception to the rule? That Surah Al-Fatiha actually is a surah that has Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as the first verse in the Qur'an. And this will depend on the script that you are reading. So if you read the Uthmani script, which you know the vast majority of the subcontinent reads, it will not have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as the first ayah, but Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is the first ayah. If you read the uh, printing from um, the uh, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, they have Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim as the first ayah, as the first ayah. And Allah knows best, the opinion of the majority still is that Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is not the first verse, but rather uh, Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen is the first verse. That is a summary of the opinions. Now getting back to the point over here, now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is constantly reminded of Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And what is the significance of this? The significance of this is two things. Number one, everything that's going to happen to you is an act of mercy to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I think that's going to be very hard to swallow because it is during this phase where he's being ridiculed and mocked, he's being physically persecuted, his companions are being harmed and killed, and eventually he's forced into exile. So when we think about everything being an act of mercy, what does that mean? What does that look like? I want to expand on that in a little bit. And the second component is, the reason why the Prophet ﷺ is regularly reminded of Ar-Rahman and Ar-Rahim is because these are characteristics that we are meant to embody and to show. فَبِمَا رَحْمَةٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ لِنْتَ لَهُمْ That it is only by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you are gentle and kind and merciful with them. Right? So the embodiment of these two characteristics of compassion and mercy are very, very important. And, you know, compassion and mercy don't do justice to the actual, na- actual names of Ar-Rahman uh, and Ar-Rahim. Ar-Rahman is the essence of mercy. It is the source of all mercy. That any mercy that exists emanates from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ar-Rahim is the displayer of mercy. It is the displayer of mercy. And this is why when you look at names, you can name a man Rahim, but you can't name a man Rahman. He has to be Abdurrahman. You can be Rahim or Abdurrahim, but you can't be Rahman. You have to be Abdurrahman because there can only be one source of mercy. Now, let's get back to that other point, how everything that's happening in the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a source of mercy. How would you guys understand that? How would you guys understand that everything that's happening in the, fa- in the Meccan phase is a source of mercy? For the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Bismillah. Because for Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala promised that. Promised, promised, promised what? What did he promise? He's the most merciful to the Ummah. Okay. That's a very straightforward way of looking at it. Bismillah. Or 
I understand what you're saying, but I'm asking where is the rahmah in it? You're there, you're halfway there. I think if you think it through, you'll get it. Bismillah, go ahead. Okay, but what is that success? Okay, Bismillah, go ahead. The success when Allah Azza wa Jal Akhraja Hawa and Kaum Min the Ibadis and Ali and Mutafarika, and if the Hulum Ila Al Mishbul or La Jahannam Ila Nar, Lay Al Munha or La Ila Masir Negative or like Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ashkuruk, Jazakallah khair. Well, that last one, go ahead. Yeah. Jamil, I, 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 I love that answer. It's not something I had thought of or even across uh, what I read, but I, I really like that answer. So let's start off with that. So one of the rahmas that came out of this persecution is that it um, purified the ummah. Not even purified, it didn't allow for hypocrites to exist because Islam wasn't in a source of strength. They didn't have their own state. They didn't have wealth, you know, None of that existed. So the only reason you would accept Islam at this time was for its purity and for what it had to offer. Right? So the people that were surrounded by the Prophet wasallam were the purest of human beings, the most loyal of human beings that were willing to withstand the persecution. Number two, we'll build off the uh, other point, which is you have to go through hardships and calamity before you can attain greatness. There is no greatness before attaining hardship and calamity. Which brings me to the points that I wanted to share. Our understanding of mercy and compassion is softness and gentleness. And for the most part, that is true. That mercy and compassion are softness and gentleness. But it is also victory. It is also acceptance. Right? It is through this hardship that the Prophet ﷺ went through, the mocking, the ridiculing, the persecution, the killing, that all of this led to the Fath of Makkah, right? All of this led to the people eventually accepting Islam, the vast majority of the Makkans accepting Islam through these phases where the Prophet ﷺ had to patiently endure everything that he went through, everything that he went through. And then the greatest rahmah out of all of this is the fact that the Prophet ﷺ will be entered into paradise as the greatest human being to have ever walked on this planet, as the most beloved of Allah's creation to him. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ tells us that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a people, he tests them. And the most tested of people are the prophets and those that follow their ways. Fal amthal fal amthal. So all of that has to be understood in its context. But the thing that I want to highlight is that mercy does not necessitate gentleness, ease, and comfort. Mercy can also be encompassing of hardship, pain, and calamity if there's something greater behind it. Like in our case, the forgiveness of sins and the raising of darajat in you know, being uh, uh, honored with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are, we are entered into paradise. So we have to understand what mercy means in its context. In its context. Yes. I have, a, I have a concept around that that troubles me. Right? So when, when we were growing up or whatever, we went through hardships and struggle because our parents were first generation and they didn't have the same opportunities. They were uneducated. So we went through hardship to achieve the goals that we achieve today. 
Yeah. Now the kids or your kids now or the younger generation now they're they're blessed in the sense of the opportunities and stuff that they have now. We didn't have Islamic schools. We didn't have access to even financial uh, you know access. But why 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 can't somebody who has that blessing and has it say easier? have to go through the hardship to achieve it. Right? And, and this is coming from a person, like I'm struggling with my neck, and I'm like, look, you're blessed with what opportunities and stuff you have. Why can you not see the, the blessings? Why do you have to go through a hardship to achieve or appreciate? Like, I don't understand why do we actually, like, cause he's saying, well, you guys had it hard, so it's better for you, so, but I got all this stuff handed to me, I'm like, well, I, I would die to have what you have as an opportunity and take advantage of it. Why can you not take advantage of, of the, the blessing of the chayr? And is there an example where, you know, where somebody's born in, in, in that environment where they're blessed and they take advantage of it? Because right now I'm finding it's like, it's an ex well, it's not my fault we're rich. Like, you know, it's an excuse for not being yeah. lazy or whatever. Like. I, I, you want to answer? Bismillah. Yeah. Go ahead. Due to all the communications and social media and all the, the struggles. I'll simplify it. You know, at the end of the day, there's two main uh, positive. Uh, or sorry, emotional affiliations that we're commanded with patience and gratitude, right? And at the end of the day, we're patient upon the hardships that we face, and we're meant to be grateful for the blessings that we experience. Almost everyone will get closer to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in moments of hardship and calamity. Very few people will be grateful to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in moments of prosperity. And this is why Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us, "Waqalilu min ibadi ashkur." that very few of my slaves will actually be grateful. And this is why, that going back to the concept of mercy, had the ummah been prosperous from the very get-go, it would have been infiltrated by hypocrites, it would be very easy to become lackadaisical and apathetic and be ungrateful, but when it's filled with hardship and calamity, you will always remember your early roots, you'll always remember your early beginnings. Now people that don't have early beginnings to remember, they're going to be spoiled brats, and that's what ends up happening. So as human beings, it's a lot easier to be patient and to seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in hardship and calamity than it is to be grateful and seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in gratitude. Wallahu ta'ala alam. We move on to year number three. We move on to year number three. And Miraj Muhyiddin, he argues that it is in year number three that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa starts giving public da'wah. In year number three, public da'wah. So years number one and two, it's just personal, private da'wah. You know someone, you speak to them privately, that's it. But in year number three, uh, Surah Al-Shu'ara is revealed to the Prophet wasallam, and he's commanded to uh, invite his family to Islam. Invite his family to Islam. So he mentions that there's two main incidents that happen. Incident number one, he puts a dinner together for his family, invites them over, and he invites them to Islam. He tells them that, um, you know, I, I invite you to Islam. And Ali radiallahu anhu shows his interest. But Abu Lahab, he throws a, a wrench into the plan and says this is, you know, nonsense. This is not the way of our, of our forefathers. And this is not something that we're going to listen to. And that dinner party was pretty much broken up. Then incident number two is what a lot of people are familiar with, where the Prophet ﷺ climbed one of the smaller mountains in Mecca. And he tells them that, oh people, if I was to tell you that there was an army behind this mountain that was coming to attack you, would you believe me? And this is why it's very important to remember that when they were calling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al -Amin, this is the same man, like nothing's changed, it's a very short period of time, literally, you know, a few years ago, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was called al -Amin and he's celebrated for being the trustworthy. What's changed in that time? Nothing, other than the fact 
that they feel this is going to put a damper on their plans. For some people who want to become the leaders of Quraysh, they can no longer become the leaders of the Quraysh. For some people that are threatened by the fact that our economy is going to be threatened, we are no longer going to be rich and prosperous. For other people that have positions of power and authority, they fear all that is going to be taken away. So now the Prophet ﷺ stands and he commands the people to, to follow him. And again, you have uh, Abu Lahab and Abu Jahl basically mocking the Prophet ﷺ. But what's really interesting is what, uh, how Abu Talib responds to this now. So as we know, Abu Talib, he was the second male caretaker of the Prophet ﷺ. So there is that very personal and close relationship to the Prophet ﷺ, almost as if he is a son. And he tells him, do what you have been ordered, I shall protect and defend you, but I cannot quit the religion of Abdul Muttalib. I cannot quit the religion of Abdul Muttalib. And the story of Abu Talib is such a fascinating one. You literally witness all the persecution, you witness revelation, you witness the impact that he has, but it's still not enough to convince you of Islam. And he dies as a non-Muslim, subhanAllah. And that's such a, a difficult thing to logically reconcile, because we assume that if we see enough miracles, eventually we'll accept Islam, as if guidance is a logical thing. And it isn't. It isn't. It is a supernatural thing. And this is why even the Prophet ﷺ is told, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ That you, Muhammad ﷺ, do not guide those who, whom you love. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ But rather it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that guides whomever He pleases. That guides whomever He pleases. And subhanAllah, you know, even the, the story of Abu Talib is a very sad one. Because you can also... Imagine how much the Prophet ﷺ loved him, being a fatherly type figure. And the Prophet ﷺ is concerned for the whole entire ummah. Clearly he was more concerned for his own family members that loved him dearly as well. Yet even then he wasn't able to save him. Save him. Even then he wasn't able to save him. It was also during this incident of the mountain that the uh, second woman accepted Islam. And the second woman was the wife of Al-Abbas, Ummul Fadl. The second woman was the wife of his uncle Abbas, Ummul Fadl. So now we see that um, we have an increase in the men and the women. So now, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is standing on, on Mount Safa, and Abu Lahab is mocking him, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala eventually reveals Surah Al-Lahab, right? Like, you know, there's no polite way to translate this other than the fact that may you be annihilated and destroyed and may you perish in the most humiliating and disgraceful of ways, Abu Lahab. Right? And this, this is a, a very fascinating concept that it's, you get ajr for cursing Abu Lahab. Like, can you imagine that is the legacy of Abu Lahab? You get ajr for cursing him, subhanAllah. You get ajr for cursing him. Like that is how evil this man was, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserved his name till the end of eternity to be mocked and cursed. That is how evil he was. And this shows us, subhanAllah, that those people that were arrogant against Islam, against the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't forget them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not leave them be, but rather he increases them in their sins so that he can justify the severe punishment against them. So that he can uh, justify the severe punishment against them. And this is what we see with uh, Abu Lahab. The fact that he used to say, perish you all day, have you summoned us for such uh, useless and futile things? It is Abu Lahab that would be uh, perishing. That he is the one that would be uh, left unremembered. So now as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is giving this public da'wah, one of the things that we have to look at to the Quraysh society is that the Quraysh are becoming more affluent. The richer are becoming richer and the poorer are becoming poor. Not to the degree that we're seeing in our times today, but there is a uh, discrepancy uh, that is taking place. And eventually the rich merchants, they are the ones that are controlling society. Almost as if it is our society today where the corporations and the rich people are running society. And then when the rich would commit crimes and do evil things, 
there's no one there really to hold them accountable. There's no one there really to hold them accountable. So you see that uh, these affluent people, and I'll read out from the book over here, he says, but he was no longer prepared to carry out the chief's traditional duty of looking after the poor members of the clan. So as these rich people are getting richer, they are saying to themselves, why should I be responsible for looking after the poor members of my tribe? Nothing short of a miracle could reverse the growing trend of exploitive individualism that had taken hold of the Quraysh. So they no longer believe in the tribal system, and this is not at a grand scale, but it's starting to emerge amongst the few rich elite people that they don't want to be a part of the tribe. They don't want to be a part of the, the, their clan because they feel they've earned this money, these riches are theirs, this prosperity is theirs. Why should they have to share it? The conduct of the rich Makkians would have been looked on as dishonorable in the desert. So the people that are the Bedouin tribes that are in the desert would view the actions of these businessmen as dishonorable. But inside the city, these are the noble ones that everyone is looking up to and striving to be like because they're rich and affluent. Now you bring this to you know, our day and age, like you think of some of the richest people. You think of someone like Jeff Bezos, right? One of the richest individuals, openly you know, cheats on his wife, yet he's still you know, awed and, and revered because of the wealth that he has. You look at someone like Elon Musk, you know, a variety of different issues. You wouldn't even know where to, to begin with him, subhanAllah. But again, one of the most influential people in our society, just because of the wealth that he has. And this trend will always be the case. The rich people will always be the revered because the poor always want to be like them. But if you don't crave wealth, they're not going to revere the status. Which is what the nomads, what, who we were speaking about, the nomadic tribes where Halima was from, they didn't care about wealth. They were content with their lifestyles. And when they would see such behavior, it would be despicable and dishonorable to them. It would be despicable and dishonorable to them. Which is uh, another sign that, you know, when you're in the rat race, you're just running. You're not paying attention to what's happening beside you, in front of you, behind you. But when you can separate yourself from the rat race, and you can focus on the simplicity of life and the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you can definitely recognize a wrong when it's wrong. Which brings us to year number four. And then this is the, actually where we're going to be stopping for today because year number five is the Hijrah to Abyssinia, the Hijrah to Abyssinia. So now in year number four, let's look at all the people that have accepted Islam by now. You have Khadija, Ali, Zayd, Um Ayman, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, Safiya, Zubair ibn Awam, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas, Umair ibn Abi Waqas, Abdullah ibn Jahash, Ubaidullah ibn Jahash, Zainab ibn Jahash, Hamna ibn Jahash, Um Al-Fadl ibn Al-Harith, uh, Maymuna ibn Al-Harith, Asma ibn Umais, and Salma ibn Umais. And these are some of the major supporters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now in year number four, this is where the first public encounter takes place, the first public confrontation. So everything else has just been an oral exchange, but now you see that the Quraysh are physically attacking the uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's companions. And Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas uh, wounded one of the instigators, wounded one of the instigators. And this is where the believers are commanded to be patient upon the physical harm that the Quraysh are doing. Do not physically retaliate, right? Bear what they're doing with patience. And you can imagine, subhanAllah, how hard that is. Someone physically attacks you and persecutes you, you're being told just remain patient, withdraw yourself, do not engage with them. Which further, as we discuss, you know, inshallah, when we do the Medinan phase of the, of the seerah, this allegation of, you know, Islam being violent and barbaric. How can a religion be violent and barbaric when for the first 13 years its followers are being persecuted and they're not allowed to retaliate? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade them from physically retaliating. So that incident happened. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqas retaliated and he wounded someone and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed that they should be patient. The Quraysh were feeling increasingly threatened by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's growing influence and asked Abu Talib to intervene. When Abu Talib asks his nephew to concede, the Prophet ﷺ responds, and this is the famous statement, Oh my uncle, but if they put the sun in my right and the moon in my left, on condition that I abandon this course, I would not abandon it until Allah has made me victorious or I perish therein. Difference of opinion on the authenticity of it, but he mentions it. But what's beautiful is that even though Abu Talib doesn't accept Islam, look at the vow that he gives him. 
Abu Talib returns the oath with his own, go and preach what you please, for by Allah I will never forsake you. For by Allah I will never forsake you. And this further you know, leads to that discussion, the assumption that all non-Muslims are evil. Right? We see this time and time again in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ. There were few non-Muslims that stuck by the Prophet ﷺ and were, lawyer, uh, were loyal to him. One of them was Abu Talib. And that is that even non-Muslims need to be taken on their individual merit and gross generalizations, just like we wouldn't appreciate them, uh, should not be done in return. In year number four, a lot of the verses that command the disbelievers to reflect on their own selves, on the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, are coming down. So Surah Al-Mu'minun, Surah Al-Dukhan, Surah Yunus, Surah Ghashiyah, all of these surahs are coming down and asking them to reflect. One of the key themes that is going to be addressed in this phase is also warning against arrogance. And remember how the Prophet ﷺ defined arrogance? It is to reject the truth and to look down upon people. And both of these characteristics were found amongst the majority of the Quraysh at that time. That they were rejecting the truth even though it was you know, clear as day in their eyes. And they were looking down upon the believers. They were looking down upon the believers. So there's a severe warning uh, against arrogance, as we see in uh, Surah Al-Furqan, in Surah Al-Isra. And then this is where an official smear campaign is started against the Prophet Wasallam, where a variety of names are used, like sorcerer, like one that destroys families, like one that does not think clearly, and all of these names are now being used against the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam till we get to Surah Abasa. And Surah Abasa is towards the end of the fourth year. And this is actually considered a turning point where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has not been able to convince the Makhzum tribe nor the Abdul Shams clan to accept Islam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was focused on giving da'wah to Al-Walid ibn al mughira the head of the Makhzum tribe. And that is when Abdullah ibn Abi Maktoum came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, basically saying, look, I'm ready to accept Islam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam ignored him and frowned at him. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Surah Abasa. That you have someone that is willing to ready and ready to accept Islam and to embrace it, yet you have someone that openly shows disdain and hatred towards you and everything that you stand for. Why would you not embrace the one that is willing to embrace you? And Surah Abasa was a turning point for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam according to Miraj Muhyiddin, where then he started focusing on giving da'wah to the masses as opposed to focusing on the elite of the Quraysh, as opposed to focusing on the elite of the Quraysh. And that leads to year number five, which is the Hijrah to Abyssinia and the revelation of Surah Al-Najm. And that is where we will pick up next week, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala alam, wa sallallahu sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. And inshallah we open up the floor for questions, thoughts, comments, concerns. Anything? Bismillah, go ahead. So at that time, the things that were greatest to them was that which is visible by sight, right? So there was nothing greater than the sun and the moon because of how apparent they were and how celestial they, they seemed, right? So that is why he said, if you put, the, put them in my hands, I, I would still wouldn't give it. Like, you give me control of the universe, I would never abandon this mission, subhanAllah. Wallahu Adam. Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in Surah Al-Balad, al it says, uh, yeah. So when Abu Lahab, like what the brother was saying, like how kids are raised and stuff like that, and the blessings, I'm trying to understand, like, we're always struggling. So there's uh, basically no blessings. So, the pro like, like, did the Prophet struggle in this context with Abu Lahab? Clearly, the Prophet struggled with Abu Lahab, without a shadow of a doubt. Right? He's one of, his, one of his greatest antagonizers. And it, it hurts the most because he's one of his closest family members as well. Right? Right. So clearly there's a lot of pain that's felt with the actions of Abu Lahab. 
But with regards to the, the verse that you're referring to in Surah Al-Balad, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ is that mankind, the nature of life is to struggle. It's not meant to be easy, right? So anyone that has this misconception that life is meant to be easy and enjoyable for prolonged periods of time needs to get rid of that misconception, right? If life is easy for prolonged periods of time, you're living life the wrong way. So there's no blessing. What do you mean? Like, if that's life, where is the blessing? So this goes back to our, our previous point, how do we understand mercy? Is mercy always ease? It's not, right? And just like is test always hardship, it's not. You are tested in patience and in gratitude. You're tested in hardship and in prosperity, right? So when you're in hardship, it's more physical hardship that you're experiencing. But in prosperity, it's internal hardship because you're feeling emptiness, you're feeling a void. This is what the rich and the elite are always feeling. This is why they're the, the leaders of committing suicide because of that emptiness and that void that's inside of them, even though physically they have everything that they need, right? So you're either being tested physically or, uh, or spiritually and with patience or with gratitude, right? Wallahu alam. Go ahead. Yeah. Of course. And I know that the Prophet Sarah was speaking, um, you were mentioning that he did Hanuk, where before the Prophet said, Allah said, How do you, how, in the modern day world, how does one do that? How do you maintain that separation between myself and what I believe, and maintain that, that hayat, that innocence, that, that purity that? Yeah. That, that is a great question. What was really fascinating is why didn't the Prophet ﷺ continue the Tahannuth after revelation? Right? So this shows us that Tahannuth was applicable before revelation, but after revelation, Wahi gave him everything that he needed. Right? So that's the, the first thing to look at. Number two, desensitization is a, is a process. And at the end of the day, this is why those that are put in difficult circumstances are treated very differently to those that are put in easier circumstances. And the way I will equate it is that yes, falling into fawahish is a sin and is evil. But the more easier it becomes and the more accessible it becomes, the less the severity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's punishment because of the, great, the greater the desire is. And that is why when you look at the hadith of the Prophet sallam, as to people whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not look at on the Day of Judgment, one of them is an, a very old man that still commits zina. And the scholars mention that the reason why this is mentioned is because the desire at that point has diminished. And you're only doing it because you can. But the reverse is also true. The greater the desire and the greater the temptation and the greater the availability of that temptation, the more it is hoped that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be merciful. So as, uh, as cliche as it's going to sound, try your best in protecting your children. Give them the best tarbiyah that you can. And then leave the rest up to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like that's the best that you can do, right? Wallahu ta'ala anam. Oh, yeah, okay. Of course. Sorry, just before you continue, well, you had a reflection. Yeah. No, finish and then we'll, we'll go to her, inshallah.
صلى الله عليه وسلم الله أكبر صلى الله عليه وسلم Amen. 100%. And I think, you know, a beautiful example of this is that um, after Surah Al-Lahab is revealed, uh, Umm Jamil comes uh, looking for the Prophet ﷺ, and Abu Bakr is with the Prophet ﷺ, and she comes to Abu Bakr, and she asks, you know, where is your companion? And Prophet ﷺ is literally right there, but she's unable to see him. And she refers to him as Mudhammam, like one who is belittled and, and, and debased. And after she leaves... The Prophet ﷺ says, I am Muhammad, the one that is praised and that is elevated. And this is the, the reality of it at the end of the day. Now our, our sister over there. Hmm. Jazakallah khair. May Allah have mercy upon her. Um, with that being said, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu Allah haqqa tuqatihi wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimun. That all you who believe have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and do not die except in a state of Islam. The Mufassirun, they comment on this verse that those that strive to live a life of taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will allow them to die upon Islam. But those that don't live a life of taqwa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow them to die uh, upon Islam. So what we want to extract over here is, inshallah, if this person lived a good righteous life and experienced these hardships and calamities, then inshallah it is a good sign. It is a good sign. But if a person didn't li live a, a life of righteousness and they didn't do good deeds and they didn't have taqwa and they're experiencing these hardships and calamities, then this is just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increasing their pain in this dunya before he increases their pain in the akhirah. That's number uh, one. Number two, with regards to uh, a position, uh, with regards to the afterlife, understand that purification is required before people enter into Jannah. And even entering into Jannah is contingent upon the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let's start with that. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is attained through the good deeds that we do or the patience that we show through the hardships that we face. And with the vast majority of us, it's going to be a combination between the two. Some people will excel in their good deeds, so their hardships and calamities will be decreased. Some people will excel in their patience uh, because they don't have those good deeds. But for the vast majority of people, it will be a combination between the two. That through those two things, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows mercy to us, through which we are entered into paradise. Which leads us to Jannah is the purest of places and will only allow the purest of people. And that purification process starts in the life of this world That through the hardships and calamities that you face Through the pangs of death Through being tested uh, in the qabr Through the tests that we all face on the day of judgment Through some believers even having to go to the hellfire Before they're entered into Jannah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from that And allow us in, to enter into Jannah without hisab and adab Ameen that is what actually happens. So now, to make an assumption that someone who faces hardship and calamity and sickness and disease towards the end of their life is righteous or not righteous, this is not something that we will know for sure. But we can make an assumption that if we knew them to lead righteous lives and then they had this sort of ending, inshallah it is a sign that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is purifying them and that their afterlife will be easier because they face their purification in this life. Wallahu ta'ala Last question. I have a question about Actually, last two questions. Go ahead. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, go ahead, Bilal. Yeah. I was going to say, in regards to Islamic knowledge and the pursuit of Islamic knowledge, at different levels, um, how, how, and I, I kind of know the answer, but how is it like when the scholars go to pursue continuing knowledge, even as they're, when they get to the scholarly um, position? So, I mean, you go to an undergraduate, you'll study, you get your degree. And then my understanding is a lot of sheikhs, like in this modern day, they get that, but I've heard that the real knowledge they got were actually outside it university or the Islamic schools that they went to. But more, how is it though now in this day and age versus in the past methodology, like even maybe specific to yourself, like you have teachers still, right? That you, but is it informal or do you actually have formal studies for yourself at a higher level? I start off by giving the disclaimer. I do not identify as a scholar nor claim to be a scholar. And the, the, the greatest manifestation of this is I do not have any continuous studies for myself other than what comes through me trying to follow series on YouTube and asking my teachers questions on WhatsApp and through the things that I teach. Like that is my growth in, in, in knowledge and my continuation. But with that being said, I think rather than looking at contemporary scholars go back and I keep thinking of two things. One is uh, the ha Abdullah ibn Unais. Right? He was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ who heard one hadith about the Day of Judgment. He traveled a far distance to Egypt to meet Jabir anhu. Jabir invited him into his house after he conveyed the hadith to him. And he said, no, like I came with the intention of learning the hadith and I'm going back now. Inshallah, I'll come back like another time to, show, to receive your hospitality and those things. That they wouldn't allow their intentions to be mixed at all. And then the second, you move forward from the students of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah, al baqi ibn Makhlad. You know, he took two journeys in his life from Baghdad uh, to Andalus, one being 20 years, the other one being 40 years. Like, can you imagine leaving your wife and kids for 20 years and 40 years at a time? Like, what does that even look like? How do you like retain that relationship, subhanAllah, right? So, you know, the, the simple statement, لا ينال العلم براحة الجسد, that knowledge will never be attained through the comfort of the body. That, that's what it is at the end of the day. And even knowledge is such an uh, obscure topic. Like what does it mean to be knowledgeable? وَفَوْقَ كُلِّ ذِي عِلْمٍ عَلِيمٍ That on top of every knowledgeable person is someone more knowledgeable, right? So I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lifelong pursuit. And we need people that are specialized in every science of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will continue to create those people. Like that's the, the miraculous nature of it, right? Like you look in Morocco, you have uh, Sheikh Kamali, you look in Mauritania, you, shay, you have Sheikh Mohammed Hassan al dadu Like in every country, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manages to plant, plant a, a great scholar like that. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, will preserve this religion. Wallahu alam. But again, bringing, coming back to my point, you know, making that effort, like just because you're not going to become the greatest scholar, it doesn't mean you remain ignorant about your deen, right? There has to be we need to know how to pray properly, how to perform tahara properly, how to give our zakat, how to fast, how to plan to go for hajj, all of these things, right? We shouldn't be content with, oh, my parents taught me how to pray, so I know how to pray. No, that's not true, right? Study a, a fiqh of salah class, like go and attend something so that you learn how to do it properly, right? So that's the point that I was uh, trying to get at, that don't become complacent with the level of knowledge that you have. Wallahu alam. Excellent. So I'll, I'll give a, a short answer and then where to find a detailed answer. If you go onto YouTube and you do the Book of Revelation by Naveed Aziz, I've done the, an explanation of Kitab al Wahi from Sahil Bukhari where we study that in detail. What did Wahi look like and how it actually took place? In summary, Wahi took different forms, right? So sometimes it has a physical impact where Wahi would come down upon the Prophet and it was so heavy that the camel was forced to kneel. Or the Prophet was leaning on one of his companions and his head got so heavy that the uh, companion felt as if his leg was about to be crushed. And then we see that the Prophet used to perspire, he used to hear the, the ringing of a bell, and sometimes even the companions used to say that they used to hear the buzzing of, the, of bees, even though there were no bees around. So Revelation took different formats. That's a, a short answer to that. Wallahu ta'ala alam. 
But hey folks, we're going to conclude with that. Jazakum Allah for your attention and thank you so much for attending. Inshallah, next week, uh, 6.30 again. Just keep checking the Salah timings. I'm not sure if Salah time is going to change again. This week Salah was at 6. It might remain at 6. It might be to go to 5.45. But regardless of the timings change, our class will start at 6.30 bi ta'ala. And I share the unfortunate news that next week's class is going to be the last Sira class until we find another time to restart up. So I will try to cover as much of the Makkin phase in next week's class as we can bi ta'ala. Jazakumullah khairan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.